How long, O oh Lord, will you forget us forever? How long will you hide your face from us? How long must we take counsel in our souls and have sorrow in our hearts all the day? How long shall our enemies be exalted over us? Consider and answer us, O oh Lord, our God. Light up our eyes, lest we sleep the sleep of death, lest our enemies say we have prevailed over them lest our foes rejoice because we are shaken. But we have trusted in your steadfast love. Our hearts shall rejoice in your salvation. We will sing to the Lord because you have dealt bountifully with us. Father, we do cry out with the psalmist today, how long as we hear day after day more and more evils that are increasing throughout the Middle East, throughout Syria and Iraq, Lord, we, do, we know that this is not the desires of your heart. And so we pray your kingdom come and break through these nations and these terrorist groups in power even today. We cancel the assignment of the enemy. We cancel every demonic plan that seeks to destroy your church and to destroy the young lives of these precious children. And Father, we ask that you would awaken your church globally to fall on their knees in prayer, to seek the God who hears every prayer. And God, that you would move your mighty hand and your strong arm to crush the enemy in Jesus' name. That you would uproot every cell and every strategy of these terrorist groups to expand their kingdom. We pray that their kingdom would turn to dust in the days to come, in Jesus' name. And Father, we also pray that you would not only protect our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, we pray that your church would grow during these days. That though the enemy is pressing hard, we know, God, that there is nothing greater than the God who lives within your people. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So God, strengthen and expand your church in this hour throughout the Middle East. That as they are in fear, as others are in fear, may your church point that nation to the one, the only one they need to truly fear. And that is God Almighty. So Lord, as tens of thousands flee to the mountains, we pray for your provision, your protection, and your deliverance. Lord, let your mighty arm be stretched out and show yourself strong in that land, that they will know that there is truly only one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. So Lord, we declare you ruler over Iraq, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan. Jesus, you are Lord over these nations. So establish your kingdom powerfully in these places. And let your church arise in this hour and draw all men and women, boys and girls, to the foot of the cross and find true freedom for their souls. And Father, we surrender this time to you as your time. Consecrate this place. We cancel all the assignments of the enemy so that your word alone will be heard and obeyed, loved, and submitted to. And Father, I ask that you'd fill me with your spirit now. Anoint me, empower me, preach through me now so that the words in my mouth and meditation in my heart would be pleasing and honorable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer. 
And it is in that precious name we pray. Amen. You know, the heart is drawn to beauty. And beauty draws out praise from the hearts. Whenever we see something beautiful, uh, we are drawn to that. If you think of people and boyfriends, girlfriends, fiancés, and spouses that you find beautiful, your heart is naturally drawn to them. People flock to see the beautiful wonders around the world. Be it the Grand Canyon, or the Niagara Falls, the Canadian Rockies. Uh, after people are drawn there, beholding the beauty draws out praise from their hearts. And, you know, I've never been in awe of God's creation as much as when I lived in Vancouver. And, you know, I've often talked about how my love-hate relationship with that city. I love the city, the beauty, its food. I did not appreciate the rain nine months of the year. But I definitely grew in my appreciation and wonder of God's beautiful creation uh, during my time in that beautiful city. There are so many places to just stand in awe of just majestic mountains and the vastness of the ocean uh, and the combination of the two. And also the powerful rivers that are uh, just all around that uh, city where you can also see the strength of salmon uh, swimming against, you know, upstream against the tides. And it was powerful to see the display of God's creation in that place. And even gardens. You know, I grew up in Chicago, so I never appreciated gardens. Uh, but man, I, I learned to see the beauty even of the detail and the intricacies of gardens that were created in that part of North America as well. And when I was serving in a church, uh, the very first retreat that I was a youth pastor for, um, you know, normally I'm... Uh, I like to go from point A to point B as soon as possible. Uh, a little bit competitive sometimes in driving. But when I was heading out to my very first retreat as a youth pastor in that city, um, I was the last person to arrive at the retreat center. And uh, people were getting worried. And so when I arrived, they're like, is everything okay? And I said, oh yeah, everything's fine. And the reason why I was the last person to arrive is because during the drive there, uh, I, I was like slowing down, stopping, and I almost driving over the cliff because I was just mesmerized by the, the scenery uh, and the drive to the retreat center. And so, you know, because I'm the new youth pastor, when I was going there, all my youth group kids, they wanted to drive in the same car with me. But after how slow I took on the way back, nobody wanted to drive with me. So I could take my time with that one. Uh, but you know, that's what beauty does. Uh, it captivates the heart and it triggers praise. And what we will see today and also what we see throughout Scripture is every time a writer of Scripture is meditating upon the beauty of God's goodness and His grace and His mercy towards us, that meditation always results in exaltation. That as the writers think about how good God has been, it inevitably results in praises that burst forth from the hearts of the writers. And that's what we're going to see today. Uh, we started a new series in First Peter last week. And in this letter, uh, we are seeing in today's portion of his letter of how his heart is reflecting upon how God has been so merciful to us. And then he burst forth into why he is worthy of these kinds of praises. Because those who see, sing. Those who see God's goodness and his mercy as evident within our lives are more prone to sing to him as a result. So the question I want you to ask yourself is, does your heart sing? But the way that you can answer that question is by actually answering another question. Does your heart sing? You can know by answering this question, do your eyes see? Because when your eyes can see the goodness of God, the heart will sing of his praises. So to see and behold his beauty and majesty will naturally draw out praises from our hearts. And so we want to see today what Peter is also seeing 
and we want to join him in his praises as well. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 3 to 5 today as we continue our new study through this letter that Peter wrote. And also I want to encourage you to follow along with me in your outlines as well. And we want to explore the reasons that Peter gives us for praising our merciful God. So what are these reasons? Uh, We'll highlight a few for today. One reason we praise our merciful God is because he gives us a lavish mercy. So everyone repeat, a lavish mercy. Okay, so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Can we read that verse together? Verse 3 together, ready to begin? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so Peter begins by bursting forth praise and blessing the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He is saying, thank you, Father God, for Jesus. O Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus, O Father God Almighty, O Father of our salvation, we bless you, we praise you, that all that we have in Christ and through Christ was because of his great mercy. Mercy was the motivation behind all that God has given to us through Christ. Mercy carries the meaning of having compassion to someone in need, canceling deep debts, or having pity who, for someone who is in some extremely miserable uh, circumstances. For example, mercy would be a baby boy is born. Uh, But then he is given up to an orphanage because that baby boy has no arms, just hands. Uh, And if that child remains in an orphanage institution his whole life, especially in this country and in this culture, uh, if he is left on his own, he will face great hardship, much discrimination, Uh, He will not be properly educated. People will probably not even attempt to give him a good education. And even if he does end up in a public school system in this country, you know he will be bullied, humiliated, and made sure that he feels miserable for all the days of his life. He will not be uh, looked upon through the eyes of potential. He will face a very lonely and dark future. He will be a misfit in this society. And so mercy sees the reality of this situation and offers hope and compassion instead. Mercy for this child would be a family who sees the dark future for him by himself and they step in. They step into his life, love him, feed him, clothe him, homeschool him, because they know the public school system will be very cruel to him, invest into his development, discipling him to know that he was made by God on purpose, for purpose, and God sent his son Jesus to die, yes, even for him, because of his love for him, and teaching him that through Christ there is a great future that awaits him. And then the family begins to see changes happening in him, for him to grow in his faith faith and in his self-confidence because of who he is in Christ. And they even begin to see that he is able to learn to drive with his feet and his legs. And then suddenly mercy manifests even further that this investment into this child results in him graduating high school early, entering college by the age of 16. That is extending mercy to someone in need. And that is the story of Noah Pennington, a young Korean baby boy who was adopted by Paul Pennington, founder and director of Hope for Orphans, many years ago. That is a picture of mercy, and that is a picture of our God to us. 
You see, left alone, we face a miserable future ahead of us. Very dark, very lonely, very isolated, filled with condemnation, abuse, and eventual damnation. Left alone, we have no hope. We'd face all the consequences of our sins, keeping in mind that the wages of sin is death, the shame, the damnation for all of our days, but also for all of eternity. But God came down to us, took us in his arms, changed our clothes, renewed our status, made us new creations, forgiving our sins, adopted us to be his children, and gave us life and a future. That is our great God of great mercy. And all the writers of Scripture, when they reflect upon this truth of what God has done for the pitiful, miserable state of us in our sin, every time writers reflect upon the goodness of God, they write out and they sing forth songs of praise. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. He is saying, look at how great the love of God has been towards us. That he lavished love. He lavished mercy. He was not being stingy with that. He was abundant with how much goodness he showered over a people who did not deserve it. And as he reflects upon this, he sees the beauty of God's love and his mercy, and therefore his heart is filled with song. You see, when we see that mercy towards us and his love, and see that we were that child left on the streets alone, But God Almighty took us into his arms, into his home, and into his royal family forever. You cannot help but sing his praise. And so he pauses now and he says, as he reflects upon this good God, he says, Blessed be the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because according to his great mercy, he has responded and acted towards us. So we praise him for this lavish mercy and this lavish love which he showers over us. Amen? And that is the goodness of God towards us. And from this lavish mercy, he also gives us a living hope. So everyone repeat, a living hope. So he not only is singing forth of his lavish love and mercy towards us, he is praising him because he gives us a living hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us to be born again. God has caused us to be born again because God alone saves. Salvation is God's doing because it is God's work in us. You see, salvation is not just about modifying behavior. It is changing our hearts and changing our lives completely. And when the heart changes, everything changes. And only God can change the condition of our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 23 says, Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. So he says, can you change your skin color? Well, I guess in Korea you can. Uh, But he's talking about without surgery. Uh, So he's saying... Can you change who you really are by yourself? No. Neither can you, who are fallen, sin-stained, evil people, truly do good. Because we are bent on evil. Only God can change our lives from sinner to saint. You know, I was talking with a pastor recently about human trafficking and some of the work that we've been doing. And we somehow got on the topic of their mentality, of what they think through in different cases. And this pastor um, actually started telling me that he understood how they thought. And I was like, really? 
was like, yeah, tell me more. And so he was like, yeah, you know, when I was growing up, I was actually involved in a gang. And I was like, really? And he says, yeah, you know, uh, you know when we're, you're in high school, you're a punk, uh, you always want money. That's the main thing that you want from people. And you don't want to go with them to an ATM because there's cameras there and stuff like that. And so you find ways to just make them give money to you. It's like, how, like how? I said, oh, you know, just, you know, by threatening them and stuff like that. I was like, oh, really? Uh, tell, me what, tell me what you used to do. He says, oh, yeah, sure. He says, oh, I used to take their IDs. And then I would say, hey, I know where you live, uh, so if you do not give me the money, uh, you know, go to an ATM, withdraw several hundred dollars, and give it to me. If you do not, I'll find you and I'll hurt you. But then he said this. He said, but you know what? A lot of people, uh, they're, they're going to think like we're bluffing, that we're not really going to hurt them. And so what we did was we had to hit them hard right there on the spot so that the pain of getting hit will trigger fear uh, for them to actually go to the ATM, withdraw money, and then go back to them. And so, uh, and then he started telling me all of these other tactics that he used to have of, you know, controlling people and threatening them. And, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm talking to a pastor right now. And also... <laughs> And the other thing, I was like, I can't believe I'm getting these lessons on the mind of a criminal through this pastor. And then I was like, oh man, I've got to pray for his congregation, you know. <laughs> because he was still very passionate about sharing this, you know. Um, you know, I was like, man, I got some very, never would have guessed I would have learned these things from the mouth of a pastor. But then later, uh, because I know him, and I've known him for a while, uh, later I was like, man, this guy has changed a lot. Praise God, by the grace of God. Uh, but, you know, that's what God does through the gospel. He changes hearts. He changes lives. He changes how we used to live. He changes people who used to love money and violence and changes them to become people of compassion and grace. That is what our gospel does. It changes the heart. And when we, as we talked about last week, that we are not who we wish we could be, we are not who we hope to be, but we also praise God because we are not who we once were. And that is an evidence of God's grace working within our lives. And as we reflect upon this, that reality of God has changed me should also trigger God is worthy of my praises. Amen? And that's what Peter is doing as well. He is reflecting upon how God brings about life change. That is what our God does. It changes us. It makes us into new creatures because we cannot change ourselves and we cannot save ourselves. It is the work of God. It is mercy and grace that changes who we are. You see, we used to love the things of the world and hold on to it tightly. But the gospel allows us to truly see reality properly. You see, the gospel changes our eyesight to be properly corrected so we see things in its right lens. Because before Christ, we see things in all the wrong ways. We see that things that are temporary in all this world seem so beautiful and precious. But when the gospel enters, we see the temporary things of this world as it really is. Dust that will be gone one day soon. And then we begin to see what is truly beautiful and valuable. And that is the gospel. That is the souls that Christ died for. And you begin to change everything. How you spend, how you save, what you work for, everything changes when the gospel enters a heart. Amen? And Peter is celebrating this. Because if you are no longer the same person you once were, that you used to only dream of how to satisfy your selfish dreams and desires, but that has been changed now, you praise God for that life change. That is the work of God's grace within your life. True treasure is finally be able to, we're able to recognize within our hearts. Treasure that is coming in heaven and that will never fade. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 again, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into newness of life to a living hope. So we have a living hope 
Because it is based on Christ who is alive forevermore. You see, the world hopes in things that are dead or things that will end. They put their hope in money, which will disappear and burn in the end. They put their hope in jobs and relationships that are temporary. But we have a living hope because our hope is in Jesus and he is alive forever. But the hope that we have is not like the hope of this world. You see, some of us hope, but not knowing what will really happen. Because in our fallen world, nothing is certain. We can hope to have good health. But then things like the Ebola virus pop up and nothing's guaranteed for your future health. We can hope for peace, but time and time again we see more and more wars breaking out throughout the nations. We can hope that it's sunny tomorrow for important dates, but then it rains. But that's not the kind of hope that Peter is talking about here. And that's not the kind of hope that... Scripture refers to when it speaks of hope. This hope that we have in Christ is not wishful thinking. It is a guaranteed reality. Because nothing in this world is certain except Christ and his promises. Those two things are certain and will never fail. Amen? And so he says, we can hope properly. And that hope will never die. It is a living hope because the hope is in Jesus. The person and the promises of Jesus gives us certainty that his goodness and his mercy will follow us all the days of our lives until we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the promise that we have because of faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And so when our hope is in Jesus, that hope is certain and will never fail us. Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so scripture was given to instruct us, to teach us properly. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. God gave us his word so that we would not only learn things, but it says through endurance. And we've talked about this before. When do you need endurance? When life is hard. You don't need to endure through stuff that you like doing. Time flies. You don't endure through those. But through endurance, through tough times, through pain and loss and suffering, we still have hope because our hope is in Christ. C.S. Lewis once said, hope is one of the key theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you'll find that Christians who did the most for this present world were just those who thought most of the next world. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world, that they have become so ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. So he's showing us the necessity and the power of hope in what was promised through Christ and in Christ that is to come. And those who live with that living hope make the biggest impacts in eternity and here on earth. So it is because Jesus died and rose again from the dead that we have this hope. Look at the end of verse 3 of 1 Peter 1. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from 
the dead. The death of Jesus destroyed death for us so that if you are in Christ, you no longer have to fear death. When Jesus died and rose again, our sins died. Our death died. Loneliness died. Helplessness died. Hopelessness died. Abandonments and isolation died when Christ died for his people. And because Jesus is alive again through his resurrection, hope is alive. Healing is alive. Freedom is alive. Mercy is alive. Justice is alive. And our future and our hope and you and I are alive forever. Jesus tells us that all who trust in me will not die even though you die. Amen? This is the hope that we have because of Jesus. We are to be the most hope-filled people in the world because our hope is alive and can never be taken away. That is the hope that we have because our Jesus is alive. And that is why the psalmist can say over and over again, Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Meaning, this psalmist was down and discouraged and going through a hard time, and he is speaking truth into his heart. And we need to do that sometimes as believers. We need to preach to ourselves the truth of God's promises. He says, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Your hope is in the living, resurrected God who has conquered sin and death and is alive forevermore. Therefore, your hope is alive. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise Him in suffering. I will still praise Him in persecution, even though the world is against me. If my God is for me, I am alive in hope. Amen? That is who you are. You are a people of hope. And you are alive. Death can no longer have mastery over you. And that gives us the strength to keep holding on to him no matter the suffering. Because this suffering is also temporary and under the authority of the hand of God. Our hope is in Christ. And Jesus Christ is alive and he reigns supreme over all. Jesus is Lord over Iraq. He is Lord over Syria. Nothing frustrates the heart of God in his sovereignty. Amen? And with this living hope, we see that there comes even greater promises to come. And that is even one more reason to praise him. We praise him and hope in him because he gives us a lasting inheritance. So everyone repeat, a lasting inheritance. What's coming for you, what's promised to you, will never fade. Let's look at 1 Peter 1 again, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last Time. Verse 4 and 5 has so many precious promises jam-packed within these small verses. And what he is saying is that the promised inheritance of Jesus, our great reward, and the eternal rewards for serving him are kept in heaven waiting for you. And then he says, it is imperishable. It will never fade away. It is undefiled. It is pure. It is unfading. It will last forever. And we need to remember a few key principles about an inheritance. 
An inheritance usually means that you are gaining something you did not earn. So if a relative dies and leaves you an inheritance of their property, you didn't earn it, you didn't work for it, you didn't deserve it, that is grace. That's one thing about an inheritance. Another thing we need to remember is that it will oftentimes increase our property and our wealth. And what we will gain when we finally receive our inheritance, when we stand in glory before Jesus, will far outweigh the value of any toys that you try to hold on to in this world. And a third thing we need to remember about an inheritance is that it becomes yours usually through the death of the owner. And the inheritance that Jesus has promised to us became ours when the owner of it died, when Jesus died on the cross. He purchased for us our inheritance, a place with him, Forever. Hebrews 9, 15, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenants. So what is coming for the believer in the future is far greater than anything that we have ever known in the past or today. The best is still coming. The best days of your lives are ahead of you. The best moments that you will ever experience are coming for the believer. And that truth will always remain even in heaven. That it's going to keep getting better. It'll keep getting deeper. The intimacy of Jesus knowing him more, being blown away by the joy of knowing him because the joy of the Lord not only is our strength, but true joy is found in the Lord. And so forever that promise holds true. That the best is still coming. Amen? There is only gain for the people of God. That is why Paul can say in Philippians 1.21, for to me, to live is Christ. If I'm going to live on this planet, I'm going to live for Jesus. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Because the world has an opposite. You live for yourself because when you die, you're going to lose it all. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of believers live as well. Because we have not gained proper kingdom perspective. Because again, those who see, sing. So those who see true reality, what's really valuable, and that is Christ and his kingdom here on this earth. You live for that. Because when you do that, when you die, it only gets better. Because of the inheritance and the rewards that God will bless for people who live in faith in this way. To live is Christ. To die is gain. We will only gain more through Christ. The best is still coming. We will gain new bodies. Amen? <laughs> Who's looking forward to their new body, right? Yeah, that's right. We will gain large, eternal, spacious homes to host people to visit others in, to share stories of God's faithfulness, to see how your prayers were answered in the Middle East, how your prayers and fasting throughout Ramadan impacted those of the Muslim community. And you will have eternity to meet them and fellowship together. And they will say, you know, your prayers during the Ramadan season, that's why I'm here today. And they will show stories of how God intervened in divine ways. You see, we give and we forget. God never, forget, never forgets. In fact, God will show you and he will delight in showing you how every act of obedience, every act of generosity in his name, every act of kindness, of service, of sacrifice for Christ and his kingdom, God used 
because it's never a waste. How God used to be a blessing in this world to the glory of his name. Amen. That's going to be awesome. That you will meet people that you impacted because of your investment into God's kingdom work through this ministry, through CGN TV, through short-term missions, through long-term missions, through giving and supporting missions work. That is never a waste because that is God's work. We will gain access to the throne of God, intimacy with God in ways that we have never known before. We will gain cities and communities to rule over for those who have served faithfully within the tasks that God has given to us here on earth. We will gain deeper capacities for joy, senses to see creation and reality in ways that will blow our mind because what we are living in right now in this sin-stained fallen world, this is black and white versions of what God intended for true creation to reflect. We are living in black and white and when we enter glory, we will see in new colors of high def that we, will have, we have never known before. You have not experienced the best God has to offer yet. He is saving the best for when we go home. Amen? We will gain renewed opportunities to see loved ones lost who has gone before us. And we will catch up spending time with them forever. We will gain a new love for Jesus that is uncompromising and uncorrupt. There is only gain for those who are in Christ. When you understand that, nothing ever is really a sacrifice because you cannot outgive God. Amen? And we will gain all of this at our death. Or if Christ returns sooner, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus and come quickly. And that is why for us as well, to live as Christ and to die is gain. Because our death will mean we gain all that Christ has promised for those who trust in him. Death is different for believers. It is not the end, but the start of a new beginning, an eternal beginning. Death is now the doorway that we pass through to enter glory. Amen? Hope signifies that something better is coming, a brighter future, a better future. The day is coming when all wrongs will be made right, and all that hurts will be healed. Now is just a longing for what God intended from the start. Not just a better world, but a new and perfect world. A world alive, fresh, beautiful, devoid of pain and suffering. Devoid of of torment and war, a world without disease, without accident, without tragedy, a world without dictators and evil, a world that is ruled by the only one truly of ruling. That is the hope that we have in Christ. And in Revelation, we also get glimpses of this, the river of life flowing through the center of the city, and on the side of the river, trees. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. And we want to look at this hope of where we must put our hope, our trust, and our lives. Let's look at one more angle on this. You see, a violin in my hand can make you lose your hearing. A violin in the hand of a master gives you a masterpiece. A basketball in my hand is worth about 
a basketball in the hand of Kobe Bryant is worth about $30 million. A golf club in my hand means everybody better duck because you're, you might get hurt. A golf club in the hands of Tiger Woods used to mean a championship was coming. A rod in my hand may divide a crowd, but a rod in the hand of Moses can divide the Red Sea. Spit and dirt in my hand can make your face dirty. Spit and dirt in the hands of Jesus can open the eyes of the blind. It all depends on whose hands it's in. Nails in my hand can make a house for dogs. Nails through the hands of Jesus has bought for his people mansions of glory. So take his hand and know that greater things are yet to come as you hold his hand and follow him. Trust him. And place your life in his hands, for that is the greatest place to be. That is where healing happens, and that is where hope is born. And as you are there in the hands of, his, of our mighty and merciful God, and as you behold and see his goodness, learn to sing of his praises for all the days of your life.